uh, it's an honor to introduce you Sven Prüfer, who is a professional in the, in the space business, and he's going to give you an uh, introduction to spacecraft control under the title of Space Ops 101. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, hello and welcome to Space Ops 101. Um, my name is Sven Prüfer. I'm a mission planning engineer at the German Space Operations Center, which is a part of the Deutsche Zentrum für Luft- und Raumfahrt. And I will give you a slightly biased introduction to spacecraft control. It's slightly biased because, uh, first of all, I'm working for a particular uh, space agency. And secondly, uh, because we will look at the whole thing kind of through the lens of a, uh, mission planning engineering. Uh, unfortunately, the topic is uh, pretty uh, well large, so we won't be able to talk about everything. In particular, we will not talk about launches. Launches are pretty amazing. I'd love to see one in real life, but uh, we can't really um, go into that much detail because that's a very uh, specific and particular topic. Also, we will not talk um, much about uh, human spaceflight, and neither about entry, descent, landing. So, for example, landing on a, another planet. Of course, uh, the combination of human spaceflight and landing on another planet would be very cool to see, uh, but I can't just talk about it right now. Okay, uh, so instead, we will uh, deal with uh, one of the main uh, segments of uh, mission operations. So, in, in general, you distinguish three parts. There's one, the space segment. So, this is everything that actually flies up into space. So, in particular, a satellite or a spacecraft, uh, including its payload, so whatever it is doing up there. Then there's the transfer segment, which is, uh, well, the, all the launching business. Uh, and then, thirdly, there is the ground segment. So, we will talk mo mostly about the ground segment. So, this is everything that actually takes place on Earth in order to command or uh, use the spacecraft in space. Okay, um, the ground segment itself, uh, again, splits into various uh, subsystems. So, um, one of them uh, is uh, the, the, the main player when you want to actually talk to your spacecraft. Those are the ground stations, okay? So, we will definitely need to talk about those. Secondly, we need to actually know where our spacecraft is and where it is going. This is actually um, done or uh, uh, described by the flight dynamics. Uh, thirdly, space is at the same time very cold and also very hot, so there's the power and thermal uh, subsystem. Then there is attitude and orbit control, which are responsible for uh, telling the spacecraft where it should look at and for actually figuring out uh, how it is oriented. Next, we need to actually talk to the uh, spacecraft. This includes interpreting, uh, re well, receiving and interpreting uh, the data. So this is part of uh, the TMTC subsystem or the data system. And last but not least, that's of course the most important uh, uh, subsystem, that's the mission planning, which is responsible for scheduling spacecraft activities. Okay, so the talk will kind of follow the life cycle of a spacecraft. We will start with the launch and early operations phase, uh, which is called LEOP. Uh, for short, and there we will need to talk about orbits and flight dynamics, as well as how to actually communicate with the spacecraft. After that, we will talk about how we can, uh, well, test and validate our uh, spacecraft uh, very quickly, and then we will switch to the routine phase, so when we do the actual operations uh, for what, of whatever the spacecraft was designed to do. Um, this includes uh, well, data analysis, telemetry, and uh, telecommands, so TMTC, and also mission planning. And then, in the end, we will talk about, well, the end of the mission. So, whatever we are going to do at the end when we want to dispose of the satellite. Uh, all right. So, uh, everything uh, starts with the launch. Uh, well, not quite. Of course, before that, we have a pretty lengthy phase of uh, preparations. Uh, I will not actually talk about this, but this might take about something uh, like two years uh, in advance of the launch in order to prepare everything to make sure that everything is running smoothly. Um, once uh, the spacecraft is strapped onto the rocket, it will get, well, uh, flown into space, and there it will be separated from the launch vehicle. 
Um, from this moment on, then, uh, it's flying by itself, and we need to actually uh, control it. However, we don't uh, really know right now uh, where the launch provider will uh, put our spacecraft. It might actually be on its final orbit, yeah? so for example, if it's a rather low orbit, or it might be a transfer orbit to its final target uh, orbit, if it's actually further up. Um, once this is uh, during this launch, uh, there is actually a second control center. Um, that's the one for the spacecraft. Um, this, uh, this is actually the control room uh, K1 in, uh, uh, of the German Space Operations Center. And it kind of looks like you expect a, a control room to look. So in particular, there are many screens. Uh, on average, everybody has like four screens. Uh, there are large ones for showing an overview of what's going to happen. And there are many uh, small yellow signs. These yellow signs denote the various positions of uh, the operators and the engineers. Uh, at the back in the center, there is uh, one position that's called the flight director. The flight director is the person who is in charge of the operations. So whenever there's something that needs to be uh, confirmed, needs to be done, that needs to be decided, then he is uh, the last operational person to actually confirm uh, the decision. Uh, now, in principle, right after the spacecraft is separated from the rocket, this control room actually takes over. Uh, However, there are a few subtleties here. In particular, right after separation, the spacecraft is somewhere. We kind of know approximately where it is, because we planned, and, uh, we planned this beforehand, but we don't know the precise, uh, precise position. We first have to acquire a signal. We have to find it in space and have to uh, set up a connection. In order to understand this, we need to talk a little bit about orbital mechanics. So first of all, why does the spacecraft not fall down? Well. Um, if you look at the ISS, so the International Space Station, it flies at an altitude of about 300 to 400 kilometers, where the gravitational force of the Earth is still about 90% of the one uh, at ground. This means that you really need uh, some horizontal speed in order to not fall down to Earth. Uh, so you need to go really fast. Uh, 7.9 kilometers per second is the speed that you actually need uh, in order to not fall down on the ground. So if you're a bit higher in, in, in some orbit, then you need a bit less speed, actually, okay? because you're farther away from the, uh, from the uh, Earth. Um, OK, so we need to go very fast. Good thing to know. Secondly, we need to know at which distances we will actually be uh, flying our spacecraft. Uh, so this is uh, Earth, obviously. Uh, in particular, uh, the following picture will actually be to scale approximately. So uh, one thing, one possible place where you can put your spacecraft um, is low Earth orbit. Uh, so that's the region, region um, below about 2,000 kilometers altitude above ground. However, 2,000 is already pretty high, so very common are altitudes of 600 kilometers, 500, 700. This is a place where you mostly do scientific experiments, in particular Earth observation. Okay, so there are many, many satellites, science scientific satellites that actually try to take pictures at various frequencies of the Earth. And also, this is a place where you do reconnaissance. Okay, then there are uh, actually a bit higher altitudes. For example, there's a medium Earth orbit. Uh, so the, the drawn circle is actually at an altitude of 20,000 kilometers, and this is mainly used for uh, navigational satellites. So think uh, GPS or uh, Galileo, the European uh, version. And then uh, there's another very common type of orbit, that's the geostationary orbit. This is at an altitude of about, or pretty much uh, precisely, 35,786 kilometers above ground. This is chosen in such a way that the orbital period, so the, the time it takes you to uh, fly once around the Earth, is 24 hours. Um, this has the advantage that the, the movement of the satellites actually synced up with the, or synchronized with the rotation of the Earth, meaning that uh, your satellite is kind of always at the same position as when seen from Earth. Uh, this is particularly important for TV satellites because, well, imagine you would have to actually move around your TV satellite dish all the time just because the satellite is moving. Instead, you only have to fix it once and then it's pointing in the right direction. OK, and this is also a very common place for uh, communication satellites for the same reason, because we actually want to have a fixed uh, position in which we have to uh, look. 
OK, uh, in order to get there, for example, on geostationary orbit, it's possible that the launch provider will actually uh, put us in some kind of transfer orbit. Yeah, they usually don't, don't look like circles, but rather like ellipses. And, and that, in such a case, we would need to do additional maneuvers. Yeah? So we are on the red circle, we will fly outwards, but at some point we'll touch the geostationary orbit, so the black one, but in order to not, f well, kind of fly back to Earth, uh, we will have to accelerate. So this is a maneuver that we have to execute somewhat at the beginning of the mission in order to, well, reach our geostationary orbit. Um, okay, so the, uh, the, the system that actually deals with uh, these uh, considerations, calculations, etc., that's the flight dynamics department. So their uh, tasks are in particular orbit determination. There are var various ways to do this. For example, uh, very often you can actually ask the satellite where it is, because uh, it has GPS on board, uh, uh, at least if it's a LEO, uh, so a satellite in low Earth orbit, so it actually knows where it is. Or you can do ranging, which we'll talk about in a, in a few seconds. And from this you can calculate the orbit. Once you have the orbit, you also want to know where the satellite is going to be located uh, in the future. So you will do orbit propagation. Um, next thing, well, we, have to, we might have to execute some maneuver to actually stay where we want to be uh, or to get where we want to be. So we need to calculate uh, which direction we have to thrust, uh, we have to uh, turn on our thrusters for how long. This is also done by flight dynamics. And the fourth point is, well, we have to talk to the uh, satellites, so we actually need to see it in order to do this. And flight dynamics can actually calculate uh, the, uh, the times and the positions, uh, or the directions rather, uh, where the satellite's going to be. And you can see all of these tasks are pretty numerical in nature. Yeah? It's really it's, uh, hardcore mathematics uh, numerics, uh, meaning that you actually want to use some tools that are very well battle tested, so to speak. And, uh, well, one of the most common uh, programming languages for numerical calculations is, of course, uh, Fortran. Okay, so uh, that's really a place where Fortran is still being used, actively being used, uh, because these libraries are just working the way they're uh, supposed to work, so nobody really wants to switch from there, uh, because they're just very good. Okay, now let's go back to the control room. Uh, uh, we have talked to our flight uh, dynamics department, they have told us, well, the satellite's going to be uh, at a certain position at a certain time, or at least that's where we expect it. Um, so the next thing we need to do is we need to establish a connection to the satellite. And for this, for this we need a, a ground station. Uh, the picture you see here is actually uh, the a ground station in uh, Weilheim, that's in uh, Bavaria. Um, that's sort of the main uh, um, ground station that we use. And, uh, well, it, it, it knows where to expect the satellite, so it's a certain direction, it should appear at a certain time above the horizon, and then it tries to establish a contact. This first acquisition, it is called, uh, is the first contact uh, of the spacecraft after the separation. And this is, of course, a crucial moment. Uh, now, once it has established a connection, it tries to do various things. So, first of all, it needs to downlink some data. So, download, but it's called downlink. Um, this includes telemetry, so uh, descriptions of the state of the spacecraft, because we want to make sure that, uh, well, the spacecraft is, has, is actually still working after the launch. And then later, this also includes downlink of uh, payload data, for example. So, think pictures or whatever it uh, is, was that the satellite was supposed to, to measure or to take. And then it will also uplink some stuff. So, for example, uh, commands, because we want to tell the satellite to do something. Uh, but this might also include, for example, uh, software updates. Okay. Right. And one other thing that the ground station can do is uh, ranging. Ranging means that well, you send a package uh, or a packet to the satellite from the ground station. Uh, this travels with the speed of light. Then the satellite will actually reply to that to that uh, signal or to that that packet, uh, and then the answer will fly. Well, will go back to the ground station. And if you measure the time and if you know how long the satellite takes to actually react uh, to to such a packet, you can 
uh, calculate the distance from the ground station. If you, if you do this several times, then you get kind of like a, dis uh, like a radial dist distance profile, and from this you can really deduce uh, the orbit of the satellite. Okay, so let's look uh, again uh, to Earth. Uh, there's a ground station. It's actually located at the North Pole here. Um, so that's on top. And there's a satellite. The satellite is not to scale, just in case you were wondering. Um, and it's actually flying on an orbit which is 600 kilometers above the ground. Uh, this is actually to scale. Um, now, the, the signals of the ground station, they actually have to pass through the atmosphere, meaning they are attenuated quite a bit. Um, so you have a finite range um, of the, the ground station signal, and this is drawn here. So the red circle is, is an approximate uh, range of the ground station, and this intersects the orbit of the satellite only at a certain time interval, okay, or a certain interval of the, of the orbit. In particular, uh, we can look at some numbers here. Uh, if you have a satellite at 600 kilometers altitude, uh, you get a 90 minutes period, approximately 90 minutes period around the Earth, and the portion uh, of the orbit that you actually see the satellite from one given ground station is 10 minutes long. Okay, so this means uh, we would expect to see the satellite every 90 minutes for 10 minutes. Okay, and this is when we have to do all the downlink and uplink. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a bit more complicated because Earth actually rotates. Um, this uh, map of Earth actually shows the, the ground track of the satellite, so that's the projection of the satellite onto the ground, so that's the red line. And the problem is that after 90 minutes, the satellite returns to the position where it was before. However, Earth has actually rotated yeah, by some amount, like 90 minutes divided over 24 hours. Um, this is why the, the uh, ground tracks actually don't close up. Yeah? So instead, you get these, these kinds of uh, stripes. Uh, over Europe, you see WHM, that's the Walheim station. Uh, it has a certain range. Uh, that's the, the, the circle-like uh, black line. And you can see that usually you have two contacts um, with the satellite uh, per, well, per, per rotation. Okay, so um, after, uh, the third pass will already be outside of the uh, range of the, the, uh, uh, of the ground station. Okay, so you actually have even less contacts than what I said earlier. Uh, this picture actually shows the same situation from the uh, top, so from North Pole. You can see that uh, actually uh, there are actually circles, so all the distortions that you've seen on the earlier slide was due to the uh, projection that was used for the map. Yeah? So this is sort of what it actually looks like if you look from above the Earth, but um, the other one is, is uh, the typical maps that you see. Okay. So now we, want to, we have found our spacecraft, we want to talk to it, so we need to actually send a signal there. Uh, now let's, let's think about uh, which kind of frequencies we might use for this communication. Well, first of all, we notice that uh, there is, for example, water vapor in the atmosphere, which absorbs uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, for example, here at around 23 gigahertz, uh, there is an absorption peak uh, due to water. Uh, and the higher frequencies we use, the more actually gets absorbed. This means that um, we kind of want to restrict uh, our, our frequencies, frequency usage to actually lower frequencies in order to get a higher range, but then we also have, uh, well, maybe less uh, data rate. So in spacecrafts, you usually use uh, actually the lower part of, uh, of uh, the graph that's shown here, uh, usually even below what is, what is shown at all. So this starts at 10 gigahertz, uh, and you use even less frequencies, uh, or lower frequencies. For example, you might use uh, UHF, so amateur radio, uh, at 430 megahertz. Um, you might use L-band, 1 to 2 gigahertz. Um, in particular, the, um, the main carrier frequency of, uh, of GPS satellites is in this range. Okay? Uh, then there's uh, S-band, so that's a very typical frequency range from 2 to 4 gigahertz, which is used for the actual commanding of the satellite. Yeah, so this is an important frequency for us, or band for us. Then there's also uh, the X-band, so X-band is uh, well, 
higher, uh, higher frequency, so uh, we expect even higher um, data rates. And this is usually then used for payloads. Okay? So uh, if you have a lot of data that you want to downlink, for example, a picture that you just took from your satellite. Also, this is being used for deep space missions. Then there's KU band. KU band is used for TV satellites. And KA band. So this is now slightly above the, the local water vapor um, absorption maximum. Um, so this is pretty cool. Uh, there you really have high data rates. Um, it's been used for various um, applications whenever you need a high data rate. However, um, there are some uh, mechanical difficulties yeah? because you have uh, yeah, direction, directional antennas. So this is uh, slightly non-trivial, but it's being used more and more often. Uh, now, if you fix such a frequency and you talk to the satellite, you, of course, need to modulate some signal on top of that. You need some protocols uh, which do some level of error correction, etc. Uh, so I will not talk about this, but in principle, there are very specific uh, standards for space uh, that are being used uh, in order to uh, assure that signals that you send or that you receive uh, actually get received. Uh, okay, right. So. We can now talk to, the, to our satellite. We have acquired a signal, uh, so we switch back to the control room. In the control room, um, we are now very happy. So we have done the first acquisition. This is actually when people hear uh, 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 applause. And uh, then afterwards, uh, you, there are a few things that are left to do, actually. Now the work starts. So uh, for example, the satellite was actually running on battery uh, during the launch and afterwards. But it needs, of course, some, some new power. So for this, you need to deploy solar panels. This is done during the LEOP. Also, you might need to deploy antennas. Um, I showed you various frequency bands. And usually, satellites actually have several antennas and using several uh, bands for different tasks. So the commanding might be done on the S-band, but the actual downlink of the payload data might be on X-band. For this, you need an additional antenna. So this needs to deployed, be deployed. Also, this is the time when you do uh, all the other maneuvers in order to reach your final orbit. And you start switching on other components of the spacecraft. This might include, for example, star trackers. So star trackers are essentially, essentially cameras that just take pictures of the sky, um, so of the stars, and they compare them to some onboard database of uh, known star positions. And this way, the camera can figure out in which direction it is looking. If you know how the uh, star Tracker is actually mounted on a spacecraft, you can then deduce how the spacecraft is oriented. Yeah, and this is important, for example, if you want to take a picture, then of course you need to know where have you been actually looking at. So you need uh, some, something like a Star Tracker. Another thing that you would uh, uh, kind of uh, switch on or actually spin up uh, during a LEO would be a reaction wheel. So reaction wheels are essentially um, uh, gyros that uh, just rotate very quickly. You spin them up, and the idea is that, um, well, this stabilizes the spacecraft, you know, because you actually want to control the rotations uh, in most cases. OK, so um, now we hope that everything was working perfectly. We, we launched the spacecraft. Um, but unfortunately, uh, not always everything goes uh, perfectly. So let's maybe dig into some example. Uh, this is TVSat-1. Well, I don't have a picture, but um, there was a satellite, uh, TV satellite from 1987. And uh, everything worked uh, as we described. So we got the first acquisition. Uh, we got some telemetry from the, uh, from the spacecraft. But unfortunately, the solar arrays turned out to be only partially deployed. That's, of course, a problem. And we need to diagnose this, and we need to uh, fix it if possible. So um, it, the first thing you have to know is that um, you kind of don't, uh, can't really necessarily trust uh, all the data that you get. Yeah? You have to confirm that whatever you're seeing is actually the case. So you have to uh, use additional, uh, additional sources. For example, in the case of a, a solar array, you can actually check how much is the power out, out, uh, output. Is it actually less than expected if it was deployed? And it turned out, yes, uh, there's not enough power. And secondly, uh, once you notice this, you can actually send the manual deployment command again. Yeah? So po uh, it's possible that the automatic uh, um, solar panel deployment didn't work, so we just tried again. Unfortunately, this did not work. So it still seemed uh, undeployed. Now, uh, 
you start thinking, well, hmm, what are we going to do? Um, and you consult the, usually the satellite manufacturer. The satellite manufacturer actually all also sits in the control room during the LEOP, yeah, because there happen to be very many questions, so you need somebody on hand. And uh, they suggested, or, or the, the people who operated the satellite, they suggested various tests to figure out what was wrong with uh, TVSat 1. Uh, and I want to present just two of these uh, things you can try. One is you can orient the spacecraft uh, or the satellite uh, such that it is at a 45 degree angle towards the, the uh, sunlight, and then you start rotating it. Uh, if you do this carefully and you measure the, the power uh, output of the solar arrays, you can actually estimate uh, the the uh, angle that the, the uh, solar array was uh, was deployed. Um, so they did, th did that, and they figured out well they're completely not deployed. Yeah, so less than two degrees actually. Okay, so hmm, that's a problem. And then they did various other tests, and uh, they came up with one possible problem, and this is. Um, that there might be the, the actual stirrups, so the, the black uh, boxes uh, in the picture, which keep the solar array uh, attached to the satellite during the launch, that they might still be there. In principle, they should have been uh, kind of uh, fired off or um, removed, and then the solar array should deploy. But it looked like uh, they were actually still there. So one thing you can then try is, well, you can, uh, again, rotate the satellite in such a way that the stirrups will uh, cause a small uh, shadow over the um, solar array. This will reduce the, uh, the power outage again, uh, the power output again, just a tiny little bit, so you might be able to measure this, and this way you confirm that the stirrups are still there. Turns out this was not actually uh, really well measurable, so this didn't work. However, they were still able to, uh, to deduce it. it was probably the stirrups that are still there. Once you have diagnosed the problem, you want to solve it, of course. So let's see, how can we recover such a situation? And this is sort of where you can, uh, well, just follow your creativity and come up with uh, arbitrary solutions and see whether you can actually try them. So one thing we can do is we can spin up the uh, spacecraft. If we do this very fast, we will have a very strong centrifugal force, so maybe an acceleration of about 1g, and this way we might hope that uh, we loosen the stirrups. Another thing you can try to do, uh, you can use your main engine to actually accelerate uh, the spacecraft in the pulsed way in order to excite resonance frequencies of the uh, stirrups. Okay, so hopefully this, will, this might actually uh, loosen the stirrups. Another thing you can try to do is you can command the spacecraft to, to, well, to heat up and to cool down uh, in some ways, and this way actually uh, also loosen the stirrups. Uh, and the last thing uh, you can try is you can, well, kind of just try to shock the whole thing. So, for example, you could deploy uh, an antenna. In this particular case, this was the main antenna, which was actually stuck beneath the solar array. So you try to deploy this and hope that the force actually pushes the solar array open. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, none of those uh, worked. And uh, this was an unsuccessful uh, recovery of a satellite. So in particular, the, the, the main problem was that, uh, well, this was a TV satellite, so it really needs the antenna. But the antenna couldn't deploy because, uh, because of the stuck um, solar array. So in this case, um, this uh, did not work. But usually, of course, uh, this works. And people are coming up with uh, very creative, very interesting solutions to all kinds of problems and get things running. All right, so once we have our spacecraft in some kind of safe state, uh, well, we kind of conclude the LEOP and we start testing the actual uh, properties of the spacecraft. This is called the commissioning phase or in-orbit testing of the payload. Um, so this usually takes longer than a LEOP, um, might take uh, several months, depends on what type of, of mission you're looking at. Uh, this is when you actually start or switch on the payload and when you also verify that the payload is working as expected. Okay? So in the picture you see a, um, a geostationary uh, communication satellite, so its main payload are the communication arrays, or the, the, an the antennas in particular. So for example, you might want to actually verify that the antennas are working 
properly after the launch. Yeah? So during launch, they all they get checked up, and, and it's really pretty intense. So you want to make sure that they are working properly afterwards. So for example, one thing you might uh, want to do is uh, point the satellite on your, at your uh, ground station, you measure the, the strength of the signal that you receive, then you move it slightly, you measure again the strength, and this way you, you kind of get a pattern of uh, the, the antenna, okay? And this is a property that of, of this, particular one, this particular antenna that you might use later. Another thing that you do during this time is you check out uh, redundant components of the satellite. So, uh, for example, if you have an Earth, Earth observation mission, uh, you, as I already mentioned, you need to know where you're looking at. So you need, for example, GPS or a star tracker. Now, if that fails, you obviously have a large problem because now suddenly you don't know uh, where uh, you were taking photos or images. So um, usually there's quite a bit of redundancy on satellites. Uh, and uh, so there are two GPS uh, transmitters or receivers, sorry, and then you can actually switch between them. And during this phase, you will test that they are working properly. OK. So let's suppose uh, we have done this and everything is working as expected. Then we start with the routine phase. Uh, the routine phase is uh, sort of the main phase of the operation. So that's when you actually do the science experiments or you start uh, offering communication services or whatever it is you're doing. Uh, this picture is, uh, uh, is a picture of the, the mission uh, Teresa Tandem X. So th those are two radar satellites flowing in, flying in uh, low Earth orbit, and uh, they can actually make uh, three-dimensional maps on, of the ground by sending a radar signal and then receiving it. And because they're flying in close formation, so something like a few hundred meters apart from each other, they, they actually get this kind of uh, stereographical um, um, uh, th 3D information. Okay? And during the routine phase, a uh, scientist would actually order a data take or a picture of this kind um, somewhere, maybe online, and then somehow uh, the, the, the mission would actually command this, or the, the command center would command this data take. It gets downlinked, and then the result will actually be given to the scientist. Okay, so this is the main phase of the spacecraft life, uh, so where we do this payload operations. Uh, by the way, this picture is, uh, is a picture of, the, of a joint American-German uh, mission. Uh, that's the GRACE follow-on mission uh, to satellites that have um, a, a microwave or a laser link between them, and they measure the distances in order to, uh, well, variations of the distances in order to uh, deduce the, the uh, gravitational field of the Earth. Uh, last year at uh, 34C3, there was actually a talk about the predecessor mission uh, here, actually, probably in this room. Um, okay, so, this is, so we, uh, this is the time when we do our science experience. Furthermore, we actually monitor the spacecraft, of course, because well, we still need to know uh, what's happening. If it, is it working properly? We will, of course, continue to handle contingencies, but hopefully there are none anymore. And we might also adapt to new uh, mission requirements. So, for example, um, uh, well, you could actually try to devise new kinds of experiments uh, on a flying satellite, and for that you might need to upload new software, which is also done uh, during this phase. Another issue is that a spacecraft actually ages. So, for example, a battery might deteriorate. Yeah? So its, it's uh, total uh, capacity actually um, uh, uh, gets smaller over time, so uh, you need to adapt to that. Uh, for example, uh, if there's less power available, then you can actually do fewer uh, data takes, uh, something like that. And you need to monitor this and react accordingly. Okay, so how does the monitoring work? Uh, well, that's part of the, the TCTM and the data uh, subsystem or system. And um, the idea is that the spacecraft actually measure, measures uh, various properties that it, uh, that it has or that describe the state all the time. So we have a time series of binary data and also of uh, uh, numerical values. So for example, here the plot shows the temperature of a certain part of the spacecraft over time. But remember, we don't have this information available live. We only get this uh, once we actually downlink it, okay? And then we get uh, a huge... Uh, uh, well, part of the data at once. Uh, okay, so this describes the state of the spacecraft 
and there can be lots of parameters. So, for example, 20,000 uh, telemetry parameters for uh, one spacecraft is, uh, is possible. If you measure something once every second, you do this for a few years, 20,000 parameters, this means that you have a lot of data. So obviously you can uh, do a lot of uh, data analysis, time series analysis with that. You can do anomaly detection, telemetry predic prediction, or um, uh, yeah, detecting errors or problems with, uh, within this uh, data. Um, also what you need to do is, uh, you kind of need to save this to some kind of offline database because lots of other subsystems actually need this data because they uh, want to know what is the state of the uh, of the spacecraft. So this is an example for uh, for a tele telemetry view. Um, so this is one software that we use. Um, uh, it's called uh, Geckos and. Uh, you can see here uh, a number of telemetry packets. So, for example, there, is, there are a few confirmations that um, some checksum was correct and uh, that some uh, ping was actually received and was being worked on. Okay, so and it was ex executed. Uh, it's timestamped and you get some additional information and this is sort of the, the, the most, uh, well, basic thing you can, you can really see. Once you know the state of your spacecraft, you actually want to command um, uh, the spacecraft to do something. This is done via telecommands. Uh, and on the picture here, you can see um, some commands that have been executed and also some that are still uh, to be executed. So, for example, uh, on, on the upper link, uh, sorry, in the upper part, you see a few pings uh, which were not actually answered by the uh, spacecraft, but uh, the last one was received and was uh, replied to. And the operator can, for example, uh, already uh, load a few telecommands um, on the manual command stack, prepare them, and then execute them uh, very quickly. This is the lower part. Uh, notice that these telecommands are very specific to the spacecraft because they really need to do something there. So this is uh, in some way provided by the satellite manufacturer, and you have to um, yeah, somehow uh, yeah, understand all the possible things you can do. In particular, you very often don't really want to do like, like very um, atomic things, but instead you want to achieve a certain task. For this, you bundle the telecommands. Uh, you can add, for example, also telemetry checks, so conditions on the telemetry, uh, and you call this a flight operations procedure. So this will be sort of a, a, um, a bundled thing that will execute it on the spacecraft uh, with, for the purpose of achieving a specific goal. Another thing that's important, uh, as I've mentioned various times, you don't see the spacecraft all the time, meaning you cannot really command it all the time. But instead, what you do is you send telecommands, but you make them time-tagged, and then they get executed, for example, when you don't see the spacecraft. Okay, and these kinds of telecommands are called TTC. Let's look at an example. Uh, so this might be um, a set of um, time-tagged uh, telecommands, uh, for a maneuver. Okay, so at the time t0, we want to execute some maneuver, so we want to uh, turn on the thrusters. Um, this time and the position and, this, and the, the duration of the burn, they were calculated by the flight dynamics departments, of course. But one hour before that, we actually need to check, for example, that the uh, spacecraft is in some, uh, some fixed state, some prepared st safe state. Uh, eight seconds later, we might actually start heating up thrusters because the fuel needs some kind of operational temperature. Uh, then 11 minutes before the uh, burn start, you will uh, automatically command uh, the switch on of some additional telemetry. So this is kind of like you turn, uh, you turn on the debug mode. Okay? You, you just tell the spacecraft to actually tell you to give you more data. Then, uh, because the, uh, the, the burn will actually make the, uh, the uh, spacecraft shake quite a bit, there will be lots of alarms going off. So at some point before the burn, you will turn off these alarms, these safeguards, uh, just because the, the reaction of the spacecraft is actually expected. Then you start rotating in the right direction, of course, and at some point the burn starts. Uh, now, this should, in principle, stop automatically. However, you might command an additional safeguard stop command just to make sure that in case uh, the other one, well, kind of didn't, ex didn't get executed, you, you stop nevertheless. And then you kind of reverse the whole procedure to return to a mode where you can proceed with your uh, payload operations. Okay? And, and this would be a sequence of time-tech commands that are 
upload it to the spacecraft during an uplink, uh, and then execute it whenever uh, T0 was actually taking place. Um, all right, so there's uh, one other thing that I want to describe, and this is uh, mission planning. So it's probably the, 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 the um, yeah, one of the lesser known um, uh, uh, subsystems, and uh, this is sort of at, a, at the point where you have to wait between automa automation and manual commanding. So suppose you have a scientist that actually wants to take pictures, so he wants to uh, yeah, have uh, the satellite taking some pictures of some region, so then he has to sort of ask uh, if the satellite can do this and has to make a reservation. This is uh, been taken care of by the mission planning system, which will then talk to flight dynamics to see whether this is actually possible. Uh, give feedback to the scientists, and this will also uh, tell the operators or the, the operating, um, well, the, the telecommand operators to actually uh, execute some, uh, some command to take the um, uh, data take. Uh, however, because of all these kinds of little issues, problems that you can have all the time, you cannot really automate everything. Uh, there is some kind of, ma uh, some amount of manual commanding that's still being needed. Uh, for example, due to those contingencies. Um, so what the mission planning system internally does is it schedules activities and it tries to do this um, in some consistent and conflict-free manner. Yeah, so imagine, for example, uh, for, the, uh, for the data take, um, you need to actually take the pic picture before you want to downlink it. Okay, so the, those are two activities and they should actually take place in, in some order. Okay. Um, from this, these kind of activities that were requested by some scientists, uh, they create a, the system creates a timeline, which is then well provided to everybody who needs to know what the spacecraft is going to do at some point. So here's one example. Um, so that's one uh, one software that we use. Um, so it's called uh, Pinta, and it shows on the x-axis the uh, time, and uh, up on the top you see these black white things okay so and this is, these are actually eclipses so whenever the spacecraft is not in the sun or is in the sun uh, you can see this there and below that there there are a few um, experiments planned but one of them uh, is partially planned during an eclipse but it has the condition that it must not take place during an uh, eclipse so this gives a conflict okay and the mission planning system is responsible for identifying these uh, these kind of conflicts and actually uh, supplying that information to uh, the scientist or the operator to, to be resolved. One other thing you can see uh, is this thing that we talked about at the beginning. So you need to downlink the information from the experiment, so you need uh, some uh, scheduled uh, downlinks, downlink opportunities, and uh, you can see two of them actually as the green lines uh, above the blue ground. So. Uh, this is when the next time when the satellite actually sees the ground station and it can downlink uh, the results of the uh, prior experiments. Okay, so now uh, we are doing uh, kind of semi-automated all our experiments. We gather a lot of scientific data, uh, but at some point uh, everything well, has to end. Uh, so there's also the, the end of the mission that you have to consider. So in general, the mission time of a spacecraft um, might depend, for example, on the mission goal. Imagine that, the, that you have one specific experiment that you want to do, and this might be finished at some uh, point in time. Also, it might depend on the orbit itself. Yeah? So if you have a spacecraft in an altitude of 300 uh, to 400 kilometers, it will actually um, descend into the atmosphere within less than a year. If you have a satellite at an altitude above, say, 700 kilometers, it will take more than 25 years to actually uh, get down. If you are on a geostationary orbit, you will actually never uh, come down. So, um, uh, another thing is, and this is mainly uh, for, for geostationary orbits, uh, geostationary satellites, is that you have a finite amount of fuel. So at some point you, you can't really um, keep your spacecraft at the position where it is, um, so then you have to end uh, the mission, of course. For geostationary uh, satellites, this might take something like 15 years. For low Earth orbit satellites, um, a few years are pretty common, but very often you can actually extend the lifetime uh, quite considerably, uh, if you are very careful about your fuel consumption, for example. 
Now, what are you going to do uh, once you uh, reach this end of the mission? Well, this depends again on, on the orbit. So, for example, if you have a low Earth orbit satellite, um, then you reserve some fuel, or you might reserve some fuel, in order to actually take it to a lower, orb, uh, lower orbit, such that it um, deorbits uh, and disintegrates in the atmosphere within something like 25 years. These 25 years, they are nowadays, nowadays pretty much mandated by, for example, the FCC and also the ESA. So uh, you really need to uh, kind of dispose of your uh, spacecraft uh, at most 25 years after the end of your mission. Uh, so you can deorbit LEO satellites, but usually there's not enough fuel to deorbit a geostationary orbit, uh, satellite. Uh, in that case, you will actually raise the altitude by something like 500 kilometers and put them on the so-called graveyard orbit, uh, because that's a place where they are not uh, disturbing anybody anymore. So you can put them there and, well, kind of forget about them. Okay. Well, and then you can look back at, uh, at your mission. Uh, you have uh, spent quite a few years on that, yeah? uh, and uh, well, hopefully it was, everything was working correctly. You produced a lot of scientific data, you're happy, and um, with this I also want to end my talk. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the Congress. Thank you. Uh, there's about 10 to 15 minutes left for Q&A. This works pretty simple. You walk to a microphone, you wave your hand, and you may end up with the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, this gets me to the asking questions bit. Q&A is for questions, not about statements or how nice the speech goes, etc. So keep it short. And the first question goes to the internet, to the signal angel who has been diligently monitoring IRC and uh, Twitter on the hashtag um, whole C. So, Signal Angel, do we have a question? Yes, yes. Hello? Yes, yes, yes. No mic! Hello? Hello, okay. hello, hello. Um, we'll, need mic on the Signal Angel! Hello, let's, check, let's, check. You need to use the microphone. Get the microphone, I will give the question first with this microphone over here. Yeah, okay. Hi. Hello? Is this on? Nope. Microphone two, please. It's not on? Number five. Is it, oh, yeah. is it on now? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> test, test. Ah, would it be feasible um, to put like four satellites in geostationary orbits f um, as communication relays so we have um, uplink all the time? And why uh, is it not done? Yeah, so this is feasible and this is actually being done. Um, so, for example, the, the ISS, as far as I know, actually does most of its communication via some uh, relays, uh, relay satellite in geostationary orbit by NASA, but there are also, for example, European alternatives. Okay, so there's a European data relay system, for example, that you can also use for this. This is being used. However, it's always, uh, I mean, money is always uh, an important issue. Okay, so uh, if you're using somebody else's uh, communication relay uh, system, then you, of course, have to pay for that. Um, so you some very often actually try to, well, find a minimal solution to, to, uh, to your communication needs. Thank you. Okay, next question goes to microphone number two. Yes, this is a question from the internet, uh, mm -hmm. which would like to know about the security of the protocols, in particular encryption or anything like that. Um, okay, so I mean I can't really uh, give too many de details about this, uh, because that's not my uh, particular area of expertise, but uh, in principle, uh, the, the telecommanding and, or, the, or at least the telemetry is usually uh, encrypted, so uh, there's a lot of uh, effort put into that. However, uh, for the um, uh, payload data, um, this is not always encrypted. For example, very famously known are the, uh, the, the um, weather satellites. Yeah? You can just receive the data and uh, it's uh, transmitted and clear and you can just receive them. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question is microphone number one. Um, thank you. What, um, at the sort of point in your presentation, you told, uh, you told an example of the uh, geostat that it didn't fold out and didn't work. Um, hmm? To who goes to who goes the final decision of, oh, it's not working and we're going to drop this project and hmm. maybe start new? Who gets the final decision? And 
particular this uh, new set, while it was um, put on uh, orbit so long ago, did they just leave it there? I mean, mm -hmm. it's down and it's breaking now, I suppose, but... So one question is who gets the decision, and the other one is, did they leave it there? Yeah. Um, okay, so the decision-making process is kind of involved. Um, I haven't been part of any mission yet that um, uh, failed, so I kind of don't really know um, the details on that. But in principle, there's not just the flight director. So, for example, uh, I mentioned the flight director, but that's actually the person in charge during the actual operations. But there's also, for example, the, the project uh, investigator, so the, the PI, who's doing the, the scientific, uh, who's, having the, who's in charge of the scientific process. Um, there are other uh, kinds of uh, organizational people, and they decide this together in some way. Okay, so this is a non-trivial decision. And regarding the other question, um, uh, the so I mean they could still for TV set one they could still control the satellite. Yeah, so they were actually able, as far as I know, they to to lower the orbit to actually have it burn up at some point. Uh, I think they even tried to turn it on at some time later, and it, I think it still worked. Uh, but uh, nowadays, I think it is already burned up. So at least this mentioned somebody. I'm not quite sure, but uh, yeah, it was still usable. Well, in that sense, you could still lower the orbit. Uh, the orbit. So that's not a problem for the satellite. Okay. Next question from microphone number two. Um, you mentioned a um, uh, you had a temperature time series hmm. on your uh, on your charts. Um, I was wondering, what methods do you use to find anomalies in this temperature time series? Pardon? Uh, what's the question? What methods do you use to find uh, anomali anomalies in that temperature time ah. series? Um, well, so... Uh, I mean... Uh, uh, there, there, are, there are quite a few properties of the spacecraft that might actually deteriorate over time. And there, there might be various indications for that. Um, and you try to look for hints that something is wrong, something that you're not noticing because nothing is failing yet, but you actually want to, to see that, for example, some uh, sliding average is actually increasing over time. Yeah? It's, it's, it's still below some, some kind of alarm limit, but uh, it, it, it's, it's actually getting worse. Okay? So you, you try to do time series analysis for that. Um, uh, yeah, and there are very, various uh, similar issues that you want to identify. Okay, so that would be moving average or ARIMA. Um, ah, so, so th this particular example? Or? Yeah, I, so yeah. I was wondering. Um, well, uh, uh, I'm not sure this, this particular example shows uh, anything particular. So th this seemed to work properly, I guess. Yeah, so, um, okay, no problem. Thanks Sorry. a lot. Questions for now? Sorry. Next question is Microsoft num microphone number one. Um, uh, you spoke about commands and sending commands. Uh, does these commands get sent and interpreted by the server, or is some kind of a compilation, of, you know, and you send a binary or something like that, unexecutable? Do you ever have server side interpret, server side like? Um, okay, so, well, it's kind of like an API I mean, that you define that actually gets provided by the, the, the uh, well, satellite manufacturer. So you really send uh, a binary command. So it might be these, these protocols are actually very effective. Yeah? So they, they do just one thing. They make sure that this is actually transmitted correctly, and then it gets executed. So this might be... Uh, just switch one of the, 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 the machines, okay? So there's just some binary thing that you need to uh, transmit to the satellite. There's, of course, some level of uh, checking going on. So, for example, there might be a, a um, command counter that needs to be correct or some kind of checksum. But apart from that, it, uh, this will be executed uh, directly. However, sometimes you also need to upload some kind of binary data. Uh, for example, imagine that for some reason, um, one of the the, the things on your satellite moves a little bit, then the orientation is not correct anymore and you need to somehow fix this in your internal calculations. For that, you need to actually upload some rotation matrix, for example, describing this, this small distortion. Okay, so in that case, you would actually upload some, some binary data that gets put at the correct place uh, in, on the onboard computer. Okay. okay, next question is for microphone number four. 
Um, um, about the orbits, is there much garbage on these orbits and are th is this a problem? Uh, is there a what, sorry? Um, is there much garbage, so ah. old satellites uh, you, okay. or mm -hmm. parts that get, get mm -hmm. lost? So, so you're talking about uh, space debris, so mm -hmm. uh, stuff that's flying around and that might actually hit our satellite. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, there is quite a bit, so uh, satellites actually have to do um, um, uh, maneuvers to just, uh, well, to, to be on the safe side, to not crash into some, uh, to not collide with some space debris. Um, it's getting more and more. Uh, in particular, there, there was a destruction of a satellite a few years ago by the Chinese, so they tried to uh, blow up their own satellite, and for example, this created a lot of additional debris. This is, however, the debris is actually flying on the same orbit, or approximately the same orbit, as it was beforehand. Okay, so instead of a large target, you now have uh, many smaller ones. They are being tracked by various space agencies, and you can actually get their, the, this data online somewhere, and uh, I think they will even write you an email if, uh, if your satellite happens to, to be on a collision course with something. Can I ask a second question? Hmm? Uh, is there any idea how to remove this? Or? Um, so I'm not too knowledgeable about this, but in principle there are people trying to do this. So the ESA actually has various uh, projects uh, and has, has done a few conferences on on the question how to deal with space debris. Uh, but I'm not sure there's any really good and feasible solution yet. Uh, but maybe in a few years, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question is from microphone number five. Yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, add to her question. So she, she was talking about the, the Kepler syndrome in the LEO, right? But uh, you also mm -hmm. talked about the graveyard orbit. Yeah. So will we build a, a second uh, Kepler syndrome just a little further out? Um, so uh, I'm not sure I, I got the last question, but so uh, the graveyard or orbits, they're actually for geostationary orbits, yeah? Because, yes. because you can't uh, deorbit a satellite from there. So instead, you kind of move it away from the Earth. Yeah. So okay. my question hmm. is, will we create uh, the same problem ah. on the geostationary disk? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, in principle, this means that there is also space to be then there in geostationary orbit. However, uh, I mean, the, the, if, if you fix the orbit, then, well, with increasing orbit, the, the uh, uh, well, there, there's more space left, okay? So the density actually uh, kind of reduces with uh, larger uh, radius. So um, you're not having the same problems as with LEO. Yeah? So because in LEO, they're really you, you, you're accumulating um, uh, space debris faster than you're actually deorbiting it. So, uh, and you have to actually go through LEO to get to uh, geotransfer orbits. But uh, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not such an urgent issue there. And likely will never be, but who knows. Also, um, maybe also some comment. Um, uh, nowadays, there's kind of a shift from geostationary orbits uh, to actually going, going more LEO, yeah? also for communication satellites. So this might actually, maybe in long term, uh, even reduce the number of geostationary satellites. But I don't know. OK, next question goes to the internet. So IRC, hello? What? Yes. yes. Uh, Hello. Uh, IRC would like to know if you're concerned with the SpaceX launching 5,000 satellites into low Earth orbit <laughs> running at 25,000 kph. Uh, pardon, can you repeat that? SpaceX is talking about launching thousands of small thousands, satellites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is that going to work with communications with those buzzing around in low um, orbit? So, uh, I don't know the details about this project, but uh, so as far as I know, they talk about something like 4,000 um, uh, communication satellites in lower Earth orbit. And uh, as far as I remember, they're supposed to communicate via lasers. Okay, so they will uh, actually spend sort of a, a laser communication network, and then you just uh, try to route your the, the information that you have uh, through this network. Okay. Um, 
Of course, this is a lot of satellites. I don't know at which altitude they will operate, whether this will cause problems for anybody. But as far as I know, the FCC in the US has already um, uh, said that it's okay to proceed with this project. So um, yeah, let's see where this will lead. Uh, it's hard to say at the moment, I guess. Next question is for the microphone number three, and this may be the last question. Um, I would like to know uh, in regard to redundancy with mm -hmm. uh, antennas, are the satellites built in a way that uh, an antenna for one frequency can take over duties for that were actually intended for another frequency, especially in two scenarios if the um, antenna receiving instructions uh, is compromised and cannot deploy or for example if the mm -hmm. telemetry antenna is uh, somehow incapacitated. Um, right, so um, uh, on, on the ground for example an, an antenna might actually be able to, to serve another frequency, okay? So this is pretty common. Uh, for example in, uh, in Weilheim, um, one of the pictures you've seen a large antenna that can actually serve multiple frequencies. On a satellite, uh, I don't think this is actually done as far as I know. However, um, uh, of course you could try to route the same kind of information through another antenna, but it depends a little bit on the bus, I guess, so for example uh, of the satellite bus. So on sat some satellites uh, the, uh, the additional antennas are actually um, well, kind of separate from the, the satellite bus. And in that case uh, it's not feasible to actually route the, the telemetry uh, through that. Um, but uh, I, I guess in various cases this is indeed possible, but I'm not sure, I've never heard that this is actually being used. Okay, thank you very much. That was the last question, and this was the end of this talk. Um, a, a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.